Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the world's first square drill bit. And what do you use a square drill bit for? Well, drilling square holes, of course. Of course, it does take a bit of practice to get the technique quite right, but once you do, you can get some pretty good results. Unfortunately, these aren't for sale quite yet, so most of you will need to choose other methods to create square holes. And in this video, I'd like to go through a few of those methods and see which one works best. Now, there's many reasons why you might need to make a square hole, maybe as a means of holding a shaft in order to transfer motion, such as in a lathe chuck. And it should also go without saying, you can also adapt these methods that I show you here and use them to cut hex or internal splines. So let's get started. And the first method is going to be the most basic, and that's going to be to file a round hole into a square hole. And the best file for the job is going to be a triangular file because it gives you the necessary relief and clearance in a way that a square one doesn't. And obviously it goes without saying, choose the correct sized file for the job. So to get started, I'll drill a hole and then use a scriber to scribe the outside of the square that I want to file. Now the first thing I'll do is I'll open it up with a coarse file, getting close to the scribe lines, and then I'll finish it off with a needle file. And that is the result of me hand filing. It's mostly square, but it's not perfect, but I think I could make it work. Now despite the fact that Chris from Clickspring only lives in the next state over, so that's what, 2,000 kilometers away, which is basically down the road. Unfortunately, his filing skills haven't rubbed off on me, so I'm gonna have to do a bit more practice before I can get really good results. And it's for that reason why I'm gonna bring up method two, which is to use a die filer or a filing machine. If you're doing any amount of filing, these machines can be really great tools to have on hand, but unfortunately, these tools are just uncommon to come by nowadays. As I understand it, these were originally made for filing reliefs in metal dies, hence the name. But unfortunately, that isn't something that is done nowadays. It's been superseded by newer methods such as EDM, so you don't need to do that by hand. It's for that reason why these machines aren't commercially available anymore. And it's for that reason why I made this one in the workshop about a year ago. Now, unfortunately, I haven't gotten the amount of use out of it that I would have liked to, mostly because buying the correct down-cutting files for these is not easy, and the ones that I can find are usually expensive. I don't think anyone makes new die filer files anymore, hence why they tend to be quite expensive. However, I still get good results with needle files. The only problem that I have with them is needle files tend to push the work upwards because they cut in that direction, which can make the work a little bit difficult to work with. However, it does file a lot better than doing it by hand. I think I did this in about half the time than it took me to do it by hand, and doing it this way makes it a lot easier to sneak up on that scribed line. Overall, it did a fantastic job, though of course most people aren't going to own one of these machines, so I think we should move on to the next method. And that is going to be to use a milling machine to open up and square up a hole. Now this method will probably work best if you have a digital readout or a CNC machine, but all you really have to do is mill out each corner. You will leave a small radius in each corner from the end mill, so it's best to use a small end mill if you can.
and that is the result that I can get in about a minute. The big advantage here though is that you don't need a through hole. Like in the other two previous methods, it had to be filed all the way through. Here, it doesn't need to be. Doing it this way means you'll be able to have a transition between having a square on one side and a round hole on the other. And the transition allows it to act as a stop. One example of that being useful would be the handle for the vise. And if you need to, you can always relieve each corner with an end mill. Now the next method is one that I found on Joe Pysinski's channel, and that's going to be to shape it, or I guess broach it for lack of a better word. And we're going to be shaping it using the milling machine. But before I can do that, I need to quickly make a cutter. And to make the cutter, I'll use a piece of 10mm silver steel. Silver steel should be a bit more suited to this type of work than, say, high-speed steel, which I had plenty of in the form of broken end mill shanks. Having done a bit of testing, high-speed steel, as the name somewhat implies, works really great at high speeds, but it isn't a great cold working steel. To form the cutter, I'll set up the dividing head in the milling machine. I've set the chuck to tilt downwards a few degrees, and this will give the tool some clearance when cutting. I'll start to machine it with a carbide end mill, and when I'm done, I'll rotate it 90 degrees to machine the next face. To make the sharp cutting edge, I've loaded the tool post grinder into the lathe and I'll use a stone to grind a concave face in the end, and doing this should produce a sharp cutting edge. Now the silver steel is supplied in an annealed state, so it isn't hard enough to be a useful cutting tool, so what I'll do is harden it. The first thing I'll do is mix up the quench medium, and that's going to be a 10% salt mix in water. I'm going to be coating the part in a brazing flux, and I'm doing this to prevent any scale building up on the part at high temperatures. I'll heat up the part until it becomes non-magnetic, and then I'll dunk it in the brine. And after that, a quick boil in hot water should dissolve any remaining flux. And after that, I'll temper the part at about 220 degrees for about an hour in an oven. And I've got to say, the cutter came out looking really great. So let's test it. I'll start off by drilling a hole that is slightly bigger than the head of the cutter. I can now start to advance the cutter into the work, advancing only about 0.05mm at a time. Doing this should keep the strain on the quill to a minimum. 
Now if you have a spindle lock on your milling machine, now would be a good time to use it to stop the cutter from turning. And the process is pretty straightforward from here on. If you do all four corners and you do it correctly, you'll be left with a spot on square hole with very sharp corners. And those chips look pretty respectable. And that is a really good surface finish, much better than I could get from any of the other methods. Overall, I really like this method, and it really doesn't take all that long, and you end up with a really good result. Just make sure to keep the cuts as light as possible, because you don't want to strain your quill too much. And I really like this method because you can use one cutter to create a range of different sized holes. In fact, I only really need to make two, a small one and a large one, and that should be a complete set. The final method is going to be to use a rotary brooch to broach the hole. This is easily the quickest method, with the only real downside being that you need a rotary brooch and rotary brooch cutters to make the hole. This is the lathe mounted rotary brooch that I made earlier this year. It's simply a Jacob's chuck seated in a ball bearing which allows it to freely spin. The cap head screw simply prevents the Jacob's chuck from being pulled out of the holder. Now they do make these for milling machines but unfortunately I don't have one. I'll start by drilling a hole that's about 10% bigger than the flat to flat dimensions on the cutter. Now to make it work, the cutter needs to be set off at a slight angle to the work. This will create the cutting action that actually cuts the hole. Now initially I was going to use the same cutter that I'd used for the shaping, but unfortunately I didn't add enough back relief. So I went back and made a new one. Now it's not the fastest cutting action, but it definitely gets the job done a lot faster than any other method. And that is the end result. It's not a perfect square, but it will hold onto a square piece of stock without any issue. And of course, rotary brooches can make other shapes, such as internal hexes and splines. And for anyone wondering how these rotary brooches work, Slater Tools posted a really good video on the subject, and I'll link to it in the description. And that about wraps up the video. Obviously, there are many more methods to making square holes, but these are the methods that I can do in my workshop with the tools that I have. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week.